start with something that I'm going to tell you what I want to speak about. So, on one of the last days of June 1914, a telegram arrived in a remote garrison town on the outskirts of the Habsburg Empire, and the text of the telegram was here to the throne's rumor to assassinate the Imperial. And there was this moment of shock. And at this moment of shock, when basically the officers, the most loyal part of the Habsburg Empire, didn't know what to do, one of the officers, Hungarian, started to speak Hungarian to his countrymen. A Slovene who was listening to this and didn't understand what he's talking about start to suspect that probably the Hungarians are not so unhappy with the fact that Franz Ferdinand was killed because he was perceived as a pro-Slav. So he said, I want only German to be spoken. And then the Hungarian officer said, I'm going to say it in German too. I'm happy that the bastard is gone. So this is how Joseph Roth is telling in his famous book, The Dead Skin March, the end of the Habsburg Empire. This was the moment in which basically everybody started to speak their own languages. And in a way, nobody was ready to speak German anymore. And apparently, we are now one of the questions basically that you have in Europe is, is Europe facing the same moment? To what extent is the result of the crisis that Europeans are facing, predominantly because of the migration crisis, uh, basically people start speaking their national languages too, and nobody wants to speak German anymore. Uh, I'm saying this because, uh, you know, in the science fiction uh, novels, there is always this moment in which somebody, the protagonist, is very much disliking the results of the experiment that he started, who wants to go back and to start again. And of course, in history, this is not possible. But if you're seeing the political developments in the European Union, but also in the United States, you can see a major, major, revolt against the post-1989 world. You have the feeling that if we can go back and start again, we're going to do it differently. So what I'll try to do is the following. I'll try to see where this resentment to the post-1989 world is coming, particularly in the West. Not why others don't like what is happening, why basically people who made this world Europeans and Americans started to resent it. Why the thing that till yesterday were perceived as being very favorable, basically being the dream started to be viewed as nightmares. And then, after trying to give this explanation, I'll try again to say why, because of this analysis, I do believe that there is interesting promise in the Black Sea uh, uh, network project that uh, uh, we are started now. So listen, it was just years ago where most of the Americans believe that the spread of democracy is very much in the American interest. Robert Kagan was claiming that the nature of the political regime is going to be the major determining factor for the foreign policy choices of every nation. It happened not to be true, but now you can see a big part of uh, the American public fearing any type of spread of democracy outside of the United States. Uh, and from this point of view, I don't know how visible it is for those of you who are not Europeans here, but the impact of the Trump's candidacy on the European public opinion is comparable to the annexation of Crimea. It's not that he's going to be elected, this we don't know, but for the first time, Americans understood that candidate like this is elected in the United States. And this is changing totally the perspective how the world looks like. Nobody knows what he will do. So from this point of view, I'm not judging at all on the candidate. Probably he does not know. Uh, but from this point of view, it's very important that we don't see the world the same. Neither the world of American guarantees, no basic our view of America. So I'm saying this because it's not only about democracy. Look at the internet. 10 years ago, the major assumption was that the internet is making people much more connected, that the internet basically is a progressive vehicle, now people start to say, internet it means the end of the public space, people are living in their old sources. Can democracy survive internet and connected world? 
Uh, and even more, I'm just going to give you an example about open for the borders. It would just, similarly as the go one, you know, Bremer basically was saying open borders means that authoritarian regimes do not survive. What we're learning now very much, especially on the experience of Russia, is that strangely enough, open borders are one of the factors for the surviving of this regime. You don't need to expel anybody to go to Siberia because the most kind of disappointed part in the middle class is going to buy their tickets to London on their own. Uh, and this is not only in the authoritarian regime. The open borders in many of the countries, and Bulgaria is one of them, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, so much reduce the critical mass of active citizens that political and social change is becoming very difficult. We have this famous joke in Bulgaria about three persons dressed like samurais who are walking on the street of Sofia. And when somebody asked them, who are, who are you? They said, we're the seven samurais. But why are you only three? The other four are working abroad. Uh, 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 I'm saying this because this kind of very basic assumptions uh, are put on the question. And I'm going to give you one example from the American perspective. And this is even the spread of the English language, which was perceived as one of the major achievements uh, a major privilege in the United States, uh, in the global world. It was perceived as so much advantages to the United States that the famous European philosopher was promoting the idea of having a special tax being put on every prison made of industry. Because he exercises, uh, the, the Paris is this very famous, by the way, linguistic philosopher who is working on the linguistic justice, and he said that there is so much privilege in being born with the English language, but everybody who was born with English language should pay a special language tax because the world is very much kind of tilted in his favor. But if you basically follow American debate in the last two or three years, you're going to see that even this advantage starts to be perceived as disadvantage. First, because of the spread of the English language, Americans are not much motivated to learn foreign languages anymore. But even not only this, because of the fact that many people speak foreign languages, it means that when American goes to a foreign country, most often he's going to speak to the English speakers there. And this is not the best way to get what is happening in the country. And in a certain way, you start to get a distorted version of what is happening there. And certainly the fact that you have this type of global spread of the English language means that America is becoming transparent for the world. But it does not mean that the world is becoming transparent for the United States. Uh, to just imagine that, for example, if this WikiLeaks cable uh, that makes such a big global noise, the same has happened to the Chinese foreign ministry. If Chinese cables have been going to be spread, listen, probably it's going to be a news for the professionals, but keeping in mind that they're mainly Chinese who speak Mandarin, this was not going to be a global issue. So I'm telling all this because for me it's very important to understand uh, that the resentment is simply based not on the fact that we believe that there was some good idea that had been badly implemented. Resentment to the post-1989 world comes from the fact that the West that made this world starts to believe that the world that it made is disadvantaged to the West. So what was perceived as advantages now starts to be perceived as vulnerability. So the question which I'm interested in is, if this is the case, if we now witness such a major proceeding in the world in which we live in, first, why we didn't expect a thing that is happening now are going to happen? And secondly, what kind of a change in our old mental maps are needed in order to become relevant to this type of a new world? Uh, and I'm asking this question because I do believe in the time of crisis there are only two things that you should read. One is newspapers, but second, you should reread re old books. Because otherwise, everything that is written now is trying basically to capture the moment which is not there anymore. And going back to the things, for example, written in the early 1990s, I find it quite interesting because it's very important to understand why we believe things which we do not believe now. For example, Fukuyama's theater of history, uh, and I mean the article on the book, he'd been ridiculed by everybody who has any free time. Uh, but the problem was that at the end of the day, then, it captured a special spirit of the time. 
even people who disagreed, basically have been very much involved to debate with this vision. Because you're never really killing something which does not make sense. And what he basically made an important point then was, first, we see a radical change. And this change is not simply political, it's not only the end of communism, this change is very much technological, we're living in, going to a new world. And in this new world, there are not going to be any universalist alternative to the liberal democracy, which does not mean that he believes that everybody is going to look like the United States. But he made one point, which is very important for the argument that I want to make. In his views, the end of history world is the world of imitation. Everybody is going to be pushed voluntarily to imitate Western institutions, ideas, even language, because this is how the world functions. Uh, and uh, it, he was not, by the way, it was not a triumphalist article. People like to talk how triumphalist uh, the West was. The truth is that in 1989, 1990, 1991, it was not more uncertain about triumphalism that was there. Uh, the West also didn't know what to do with this post war world. But it was in the late 1990s when this triumphalism appeared. And the problem with this type of imitation paradigm is that this is difficult for different reasons, both for those who are going to be imitated and for those who are imitated. The problem for those who are going to be imitated, and in a way it was you, was that if everybody wants to imitate you, you start basically to look at self. It's perfect enough. So the critical distance from the American model, normally always democratic discourse on democracy was discourse of crisis. Always democracy, democracy schools disappointed with themselves. Always it was that not work. Read old books from the 1970s. It is all the time about how it does not work. In the 1990s, everything started to be presented how it works. If everybody wants to imitate you, why you should be unhappy with yourself? Uh, so as a result of it, paradoxically, in 1989, the West fell in love with itself. Mm -hmm. And now we see part of the results of this love story. Uh, but also the other problem, and quite important problem, was that in Fukuyama's term, imitation, which was perceived as a major instrument of transformation, was not perceived as something that is bringing resentment. The idea that Imitation, successful imitation, is going to bring satisfaction. He didn't understand that, especially the United States, as a result of this imitation, was put in a very difficult position. When you have all these governments that start to put elections, but basically voting to one way or the other, and some of the elections being more freer than others and more fair than others, then the United States has two options. Either to close its eyes, and to pretend that everybody who is doing this are democracies, and then you're allowing mutants to enter the political space, and then you have an identity problem, or you're starting licensing others, telling you're democracy, you're not democracy, you have democracy. I'm going to argue that the biggest problem with the age of imitation is that imitation produces resentment, even when we're talking about the genuine attraction of our democracy. Uh, and I'm trying to argue this, and this is not by accident that this age of imitation also was very much dominated by the discourse of normality. Everybody who's coming from Eastern Europe knows that the key word from the 1990s was, we want to be normal. We want to be a normal country, we want to be a normal market, we want to be a normal society. Uh, but everybody who's also basically studying the origins of the idea of normality knows that the idea of the normality has two very opposite meanings. In one normative meaning is normal is the normative, what it should be. The other is normal is what is the most spread, what most of the people are doing. So from this point of view, giving a bribe in Bulgaria is on one level normal and not normal. It's not normal because it's not like this. But on the other side, it's normal because we can do it. And here, because the normality is also the way you're regulating the world, the vertical regulations and the horizontal went in clash. You're all the time doing something which you believe is normal and not normal at the same time. You end up with this confusing and very much cynical mind, which you can see in many places there, because you get these clashes of normality. 
And I find this important because what I'm going to argue about with you is that as a result of this, in this age of imitation, imitation borrowing from institutions, uh, borrowing language, borrowing practices, uh, started to have three very different dimensions, basically, between the instruments for three very different strategies. One was imitation as a genuine transformation, and this basically was what the European integration and the European Union was about. Central and Eastern Europe simply migrated to the West. Some of us migrated individually, others decided to migrate with the whole countries, but basically Bulgarian, Hungarian, Polish legislation had been totally changed for the last 25 years because we adopted already existing legislation in the West. And everything looked like success, till the most successful countries started to elect governments, but now everybody is puzzled where they come from. Normally, people are trying to explain the backlash against globalization and this resentment to the post-1989 world in economic terms. This one is true in many places. It is not true for places like Poland. Economically, for the last 10 years, Poland was the best developed economy in Europe. Uh, you can see a modernization which goes not simply for a small kind of elite. You have a Polish middle class, which is there. You have a much more competitive economy, and of course they're winners of losers, but you cannot see a society that is dominated by losers. And then you have all these polls which decided to vote. Then being, by the way, according to the opinion polls, even now, also the most pro-EU society in Europe. And nevertheless, they decided to vote for Eurosceptical government. And secondly, which is also interesting, also very mistrustful to politicians, but as a result of it, they decided to give the whole power to one party and to one leader, and very much to go against the check and balances of separation of powers. So the problem is why? And here is my interpretation of why even successful imitation breeds resentment. Because imitation is an asymmetrical relationship. This is always the model that can recognize the success. This is always the way that can tell you are you successful or not. And to understand some of the populist governments that are now in power in places like Poland or Hungary, think about them like the second generation of immigrants. The first generation comes, do everything to be integrated, start to enjoy very much every kind of an integration of success. And then the second generation comes. In a way, the second generation is more kind of integrated than the first one, but they start to see the limits of integration. They start to go back to their tradition. Basically, they start to see imitation itself as a humiliation. And I do believe this mechanism is very strong in many of these countries. And this is why you cannot see a difference in the reactions between successful countries like Poland and other countries which were much less successful in this transformation. But imitation was also not only the way uh, to transform your society, imitation can be a very strong, basically imitating and bringing Western institutions was also the way basically to prevent change. And I just want to give you an example of Russia, which uh, I know better than other places, uh, but these examples can be given from other countries. If you go and try to make sense of uh, 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 President Putin's regime for the last 15 years, there is one important question that you should ask. And the first is, why he's insisting on having elections and even trying to convince that elections are working if nobody believes that Russia is a democracy? If he's about imitating the West, the West does not believe him anymore. Why he's doing this? But secondly, much more important, why he's winning elections which he's going to win in the world And thirdly, why he's winning the elections in the way that everybody knows that he's winning the elections? It's not a kind of a tacit mechanism. So, what is the mystery of this type of regime? And I'm going to claim that one thing that happens is that if in the beginning you're starting to imitate the Western institutions because you simply try to get certain recognitions from the West, the most important for this second type of a mimicking and imitation is that you're finding a meaning and creating a totally different regimes on the basis of the same institutions. And I'm going to give you five reasons why the elections are extremely important not for the way President Putin's Russia is perceived outside of Russia, but why this type of rigged elections that everybody knows that they are rigged are very essential for the functioning of the regime. First, it is through elections and nothing else that President Putin 
perceives the Russian public that there is no alternative to Moscow. Every five years, you see President Putin running against the same people, Mr. Zyuganov, Mr. Zhirinovsky. And basically, when people who are quite skeptical and say, probably he stays for too long, they look around and they have a feeling that there is no alternative. But this idea that there is no alternative cannot be kept in the absence of the elections. Elections are critically important for the legitimacy of the regimes. They are not just a game. The second important story and the second important functions of the elections in the Putin's regime is that presidential elections are not about electing the president, but they are very much about deciding who is going to be the government of different regions of Russia. Because if the government is unable to bring the voters to support the president, obviously there is a problem with this government and government is going to be changed. So you can see the results of the previous elections, presidential elections, the six regions that gave the lowest results, all six governments, have been changed. This is why, by the way, Mr. Putin does not like putting ballots. Uh, and he very much insists that the elections were uh, fair in his own way because he wants to see what the government, governors can deliver. But certainly, this is extremely important. Elections are about saying who is legitimate and who is not in Russian politics. In order to be perceived as systemic, even as an opposition, you should be allowed to run elections. The problem with the anti-systemic opposition is they are not simply allowed to run, not that they are losing elections. And this is critically important because every four years, every opposition party is going to be judged as being systemic or anti-systemic. For example, Mr. Navalny was allowed to run for the <coughs> Moscow one time, and then his development was perceived as negative, so he was not allowed to run next time. Force and psychologically extremely important. Russia is a country totally traumatized by uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the idea of calling the parties present, not only in the political elite, but in the minds of every Russian. And for sure, one of the places where uh, this type of fear is more persistent is what is happening in places like Chechnya. And then you have the night of the elections and the results start to come. And 95% of the Chechens, according to the results, are voting for the president. And your fear that the country is falling apart is over. You have this strong moment of national unity on the election night. And then the Russians said it's fine. But fifth and probably the most important function of the elections is it's not imitating democracy. It is imitating totalitarianism. Because to rig the elections, which nobody is opposing, nevertheless that they are rigged, Mr. Putin is convincing the people that he's in a total control of the country. It's a much easier to do it this way than to go through classical repression, than basically putting people in prisons, doing this. So from this point of view, elections are critically important because exactly they create a political regime which seen from outside very much resembles Western democracy, but then it's kept a political logic of its own. But there is a third point of limitation. And I do believe now, uh, basically, the West is facing this third mode of imitation, which is using imitation as a subversion of the legitimacy of the origin itself. I can imagine if many of you have been following uh, all this debate about uh, uh, the annexation of Crimea. And one of the most interesting moments is that on the day when, basically, the Russian Special Forces entered Crimea, Russian president went publicly, but also privately in a conversation with the Western leaders, and he said there are no Russian special forces in Crimea. This is like in politics is nothing new, and the Russians are not the, one, the only ones that are lying. But we know very well. But the problem with like in politics is that normally you lie about something that cannot easily be proved to be a lie. The problem with having 10,000 special forces in Crimea is that in four hours, even their names are there. So why he's doing this? And I'm going to claim that the major reasons he's doing it, not because he believes that anybody is going to believe him, but he wants to be called a liar in order to say liar like you. I lied in the way you lied about Iraq. I lied about this. I lied about this. And from this point of view, he now claims with a very important story. I'm again imitating the West. But I'm imitating the real West. The West that plays the interest the way basically that is not about this rhetoric. And this is why hypocrisy is becoming much more important. Why I do believe that this form of imitation is so important? This form of imitation is so important because you can delegitimize the existing order without the need to give any alternative to it. 
We don't need basic exchange. For example, the Soviets, they used to say, we want a different world. Now there is no need a different world. You're just saying, I'm going to do to you what you're doing to me in order to convince you of what you're calling order is disorder. And I do believe very much sincerely to this. Uh, so why I'm saying all this story about education and why education is so important to understand the resentment uh, uh, to the post-1989 world that we're facing today. Because I do believe we reach the point in which the idea of the post-Cold War world starts to have a different meaning. Before the post-Cold War means that it is post, but what we should understand of what's happening to the world is very much based on the legacies of the Cold War. I do believe that the new understanding of the post-Cold War world means is in order to understand what is happening now, just understanding the Cold War period is not going to be enough. And to be honest, there was somebody in 1992 who wrote a book at the same time when basically Fukuyama was writing the end of history, who very much assumed this development. And this was a, somebody who was basically uh, taught in this university, who after that for years he had been teaching in Berkeley. And this was Ken Jawit, who wrote in 1992 a very important book called The New World Disorder. And he made two very simple, but in my mind, critical points. He said, the major, he said, first of all, Fukuyama is right. They're not going to be the universal alternative to liberal democracy, which he said means that they're going to be very much a movement of rage. They're going to be a movement of rage who are not going to articulate any type of universalist perspective, but they're going to be the voice of this resentment. And secondly, he said, the illusion of the 1989s, that the West believes that this is going to change the non-Western world without changing itself. But one of the results of the export of the West in the third world is going to be the imports of third world in the West. And he didn't mean simply immigration, he talks about political practices, about different understanding of politics. And I do believe we're seeing this very much, by the way, seeing very clearly this in Europe. Till three years ago, the only policy debate in Europe was how the European Union is going to transform its neighbors. Now the major question is how neighbors are going to transform us. It's true for Russia, it's true for migration. How this Black Sea initiative fits to all this kind of a gloomy reflections in mind? I do believe that one of the most important intellectual moments of like this is try to reimagine the last 25 years in the way that is going to help us extend back like, the world in which we enter. And from this point of view, which means that we cannot stay simply in the paradigm of transition and post-communist developments, we need to bring along the history. And one of the interesting things that we're seeing is now we're going to have, because anniversary, I don't know to what extent, you will agree with me, but I have noticed that these days, the only thing that brings us to read the same books are universities. For example, you go, Hundred years of the beginning of the World War One. Everybody's reading about World War One. We have a common reference. Now, when uh, the hundredth anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution comes, I do believe it's quite important for us to remember that it was with the end of the World War Two that the three continental empires, which are part of what I'm going to call Black Sea Europe, disintegrated: the Habsburgs, the Ottomans, and the Russian Empire but they have a very different dynamics of their disintegration. In the Russian case, as a result of uh, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, the Soviet Union managed to basically repackage the empire, giving it totally different uh, legitimation, universalist meeting, but the process of decolonization was frozen. All those republics or states that should have emerged became Soviet republics. In the case of the Habsburg Empire in Eastern Europe, you have this sovereign nation states appearing. But then came World War II, they had been totally delegitimized, they became part either of the Soviet war <coughs> or others, but the problem of the nature of the process of disintegration was always kind of interrupted. While in the Ottoman Empire, very painfully and for a longer period of time, a kind of a post-colonial states appeared. I'm saying this because if you see the different crisis that the world is facing today, you're going to see the legacies of these three processes. What you see in Syria is not the crisis of colonization, it's the crisis of decolonization. The post-colonial state cannot keep their identities, and this is why religion and different religious identities are coming back. 
And the post Soviet state is a classical decolonization. It's nation states, this is why kind of a classical nationalism well known from the 1960s is coming back. Many of these states, after the end of the Soviet Union, in order to make a state of their own, there's only two things, their main and their borders. So from this point of view, it's not by accident that the anti-Russian sentiment is used in many places which uh, many people didn't expect to come. And when you basically look what is happening in the countries which are now part of the European Union, they are also very much kind of uh, facing the problem how they think about sovereignty. Because most of these countries, when it comes to sovereignty in the 1920s or 1930s, they much more experience the limits of sovereignty than the sovereignty itself. I'm saying this because I do believe projects like the Black Sea projects allows us to see Europe not simply as a project of constant expansion of the European Union, but when this expansion is stopped, has to believe that either the world is over or not know what to do, but to see these 25 years as four different projects, all of them of crisis in the present moment. One is the project of the transformation of and the expansion of the European Union. This is the most important project. Obviously, it is in crisis. But the second is the formation of the state nation in Russia, post imperial state nation, is crisis too. Because the economic model and basically Russia didn't manage to deal with this modernization. You have the end of the Kemalist model and the appearance of post Kemalist Turkey, much more democratic, but as you basically see, totally unstable and with much more becoming Islamic Republic than a secular one. And also, in these 25 years, there were a dozens of new states that appeared in the post-Soviet and post yugoslav space. From this point of view, Europe very much resembles Africa in the 1960s. If we believe that these four projects should coexist, that they're making itself vulnerable to each other, that in a certain way you can balance themselves, they need this longer history, which projects like the Black Sea uh, uh, projects offer. And in this I see a kind of a chance not basically to believe that this resentment against the post-1989 world, which we can see in our politics, is something that is going to stay forever. But basically we need an intellectual effort uh, to rethink what is happening to us and to come, if not with a new answer, at least with new questions. Thank you very much.